Welcome to Beyond the OR with Dr. Kevin Brenner. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills. I wanna take you beyond my world of plastic surgery, diving deep into exciting hot topics and delving even deeper into compelling characters that I've met along the way. We'll be talking with attorneys, actors, comedy writers, Navy SEALs, and many other fascinating and inspiring people with truly intriguing stories to share. So let's jump right in. Welcome back to Beyond the OR. Today we have another great episode for you guys. Uh, we are honored to have a remarkable health advocate, Ms. Daisy White. She is going to share with us her very unique story through varied professions to what she now is doing as a certified health specialist, which is very unique and uh, you'll see why. Through her own battles with chronic Lyme disease and infertility and with a family cancer diagnosis, she has managed to emerge as a beacon of hope guiding others, clients of hers, through remission and reclaiming their own health. So join us as we explore her uh, extraordinary story of resilience and honesty and dedication to the wellness of others. So, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> nice to have you finally. Yeah, thank we've you so been much. we've been kind of communicating uh, I guess texting yeah. uh, and it's nice to meet you in person. Yes. So, uh, your your journey involves a wide range of professions and yes. let's go through some of those like from teaching, uh, coaching and pilates instruction. Mm -hmm. Tell us kind of like the 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 beginnings of that, like how you got started and how you ended up here. Um, so, I mean, I think the, the overall theme of all the different things that I, I've done in my life is really that I'm, in my own life, had to be a stand for health and transformation. Just coming from uh, a difficult upbringing, you know, um, just not having a lot of parenting and having to find my way. Um, but when I look back and I see that there's a theme to everything I've done, um, that I was really trying to fight for my own life and my own health and my own sanity at times. And so I then realized that I was able to be a stand for health and transformation for others. Um, certainly, um, when I was teaching Pilates, I was working as a PTA in a chiropractic office. Um, you know, I've been a writer, I've been a teacher. I, I taught kids in Watts. I also taught kids in special education. So learned to help them through their own transformative journeys, even, you know, when they were younger. Um, and did a lot of story writing with children who'd, you know, been in gangs or who had been in drive-by shootings. Mm. So ultimately, um, I mean, you know, I don't know if I could, there have been so many other things, including writing my own story and writing my own one woman show about my own um, journey through transformation, um, which is a longer story, which I'm happy to tell, but there have just been so many times where I've had to kind of come out of the chrysalis and show up for myself and find, you know, the other side, which is in some ways I think that, you know, if, I have been able to overcome all the variant journeys that I've been through, including losing all my teeth, you know, um, having multiple pregnancy losses, losing my sister to cancer, you know, being diagnosed with Lyme disease, living by myself at 13, all of these things. If I'm not a victim and I'm a stand, you know, for a life that's really worth living, then others can know that that's possible because if it's possible for me it's possible for many others right i mean like some with all that going on some people yeah, might be just like no more i'm crushed, done. <laughs> get crushed under all of that and not know how to move forward and you yeah. have taken that and run with it and Indeed. used it not only to help yourself but to to now help help others correct but but and you're kind of a la local you're not originally from here so I was born and raised in France of American parents. Um, I have dual what, were, what were they doing there? My parents, um, I'm sort of a hippie brat. Um, my dad was a filmmaker, and he was making uh, films with the Living Theater. Um, I was baptized by Salvador Dali, which is kind of a weird thing wow. to say, but my dad and was... That, that's not on your CV No, anywhere. it's not. <laughs> it should, that should be. That I know. It's actually in my show, and sometimes I, 
I write about it or have named it in various places, but I don't put it on the CV because it's just sort of an odd showstopper. <laughs> um, but yeah, my dad was making um, a movie with the Living Theater and he went to see Dolly. He used to have these audiences and stuff. And so he was holding a, a bottle of Evian and a, a big long silver spoon and he had an ocelot in the room and he was like, oh, but put away the ocelot, you know, the child will be eaten. And my mom was, my sister and I were 10 months apart, so 10 months and 10 days. My mom was very pregnant and I was very little. And um, he asked if he could baptize me. And so he took the long silver spoon and the bottle of Evian and he baptized me and, you know, deemed that I would have success. And that was, you know, I don't know that I've ever heard of someone being baptized with a <laughs> bottle of Evian before. I know. That was very it's posh. a French thing. What can I tell <laughs> you? A, a, a very posh baptism. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do it's appreciate It's definitely not like, you know, considered uh, kosher in any religion, <laughs> but. <laughs> I, I do appreciate the pronunciation of it, though. Evian. Yeah. Um, yeah. On point. Thank you. So, <laughs> so um, and, and ha at what point in your life did you guys move? To the States. So it's not something that I could actually give you linear trajectory about because I moved back and forth so many times. Um, my upbringing was fraught with lots of moving, lots of new places to live. Um, I did. We did move back to Paris when I was 13, and I, at the time, um, 12 and 13, I was a child model, and my I had a mother, she's still alive, who doesn't like being a mother, so. Um, she very much wanted us to be independent, made us live in our own apartments when we were very young. So I was 13, my sister was 12, we lived in our own apartments. We went to like a school for kids in the performing arts. And um, we cooked and cleaned for ourselves and we visited with her. Is that a thing in France? Uh, no, actually, it's it's actually against the law you know, now. I was going to say, because <laughs> here it would be against the law. Well, you know. But I, I survived it, so um, as you know, as did my sister. I, I kind of became my sister's mom on some level because, well, she was younger, and I, I had that kind of temperament, you know, so. Um, but it was unique, for sure, yeah. You know, I could relate to the moving around a lot. I, I also grew up moving around. I started a new school every year. So you so, understand, yeah. But how do you think that that has served you? Because you're kind of obligated, one, to grow up really fast, and two, like, either you s learn about people, socialize, or you're going to be by yourself. So how do you think that that situation gave you some skills maybe now mm -hmm. to be able to reach and connect with people? You know, I have to say, because, I mean, my sister's name was Autumn, she passed away eight years ago, um, and she, you know, was very much like the fall. And my name, April Daisy, I really am sort of more like Sunny in the spring, and I was fairly gregarious. I really liked people, um, and my mom and my sister less so. So it, it was kind of, I was fortunate in that way because um, I always sort of interacted with people. I needed people, and... Um, the complication of that is that because I was always sort of turning to people, are you my daddy? Are you my mom? You know, I was early on sexually abused because I just didn't have boundaries. I didn't have um, the kind of parenting that would have taught me that, you know, I needed those boundaries. Correct. So um, luckily, you know, it was a transformative journey for me. I understood um, through my own survival that I really needed to make a lot of progress and I worked very hard in therapy many years of my life. I sought out a lot of support, a lot of um, deep understanding of why my life was the way that it was. And in some ways it was like gravity, you know, there was no other way that I could have gotten through it. But um, it was great because I did have the, I, I, I have a lot, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not embittered by my upbringing or my childhood. I feel very fortunate in many ways that um, I have, you know, I was raised in a way that allowed me to be, I was with erudite people that had a lot of education. You know, I was a high school dropout that went back to college, like, so I sought um, my intellect and I, and, and also culture, and I was grateful that I was given that. Right. There was a lot of neglect and there was a lot of, you know, loss, but, you know, it, it's, it's made me a stronger person and it's given me the ability to help other people. So, 
Um, and it's normal, I think, to have both. To ha yeah. have both those feelings of yeah. like, if I didn't have this, yeah. and a, a certain, of, I wouldn't say anger, but expression of like, you, I was neglected, and you were able to mm -hmm. figure it out on your own. Yeah, for sure. But it was it, am I uh, phrasing this correctly, was it your Lyme diagnosis that put you in the proper stead, or, or I would say your Lyme diagnosis and your tr your figuring it out and coming out of it, is that what put you in the position to be doing what you're doing now? Because right, because now you're working with people mm -hmm. as, a, as a health advocate, which Correct. I see much m more commonly now in my practice because yeah. a large portion of my practice is taking care of patients with breast implant illness. Mm -hmm. the, and I have a, I have a- uh, Right, you've worked in plastic surgery as well, with, with plastic surgery yes. patients as well. Yeah. Um, and, but there's, a, there's so much overlap in terms of the symptomatology of the two. I agree with you. Um, and misdiagnosis both ways that I, I mean, I see it all the time. I can't tell you how many people tell me that they thought they had, were told they had Lyme disease or were treated for it for a number of years and just, and it didn't get better. So it, tell us if you can a little bit about Lyme disease. Like most of our viewers kind of know that, like, okay, you get bit by a tick, you can get Lyme disease, but what, what exactly is it? Right, so I mean, <clears throat> a lot of people refer to Lyme disease as tick-borne illness. Uh, we don't call it tick-borne, we call it vector-borne, just because, you know, if a tick can give it to you, why not all the other vectors? Um, and of course, in, in sort of the Lyme community, we believe in vertical transmission, partner to partner, mother to child, which is very complicated if you start talking about that, particularly for the insurance industry, it's a very complicated conversation. Um, I agree with you when it comes to breast implant illness and Lyme disease, but I, I tend to look at everything as one thing these days just because of, I've had this long experience of chaperoning patients throughout the world to various you know, uh, practitioners, and I have had the good fortune of being in the OR with explant, you know, during explants, one of them was televised. Um, at any rate, um, so, you know, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Sometimes you have Lyme disease and you have breast implant illness. I had health issues most of my upbringing and into my college years, and nobody really knew what was wrong with me. I spent many years, you know, trying to figure out what it was. It wasn't until I met one of my mentors, Dietrich Klinghart, where he was like, oh, you have Lyme disease and you have bilharzia. I was like, how do you even know what bilharzia is? You know, which I is, don't even know what <laughs> no. what's it's, bilharzia. It's, it's schistosomiasis, essentially. Schistosomiasis. Um, right. Never heard that other. Okay, that so name it's just okay. the sort of schistosomiasis. African so what, word what for schistosomiasis. Um, it's a parasite that okay. infects. It's a it can infect yeah. the bladder. Um, it's kind of a small worm. It's waterborne. Um, and people tend to get it when they go to Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, and those places because it, it's in stiller water. Okay. Um, which I was, and so, and I did have really bad dysentery when I was there, so, um, but anyway, um, I, for many years, I was given all the alphabet diagnoses, CFS, you know, EBV, all those things, and it took me many years to sort of put it together and understand that um, there was a component of my health issue that was, um, chronic infections, you know? And in, in, in the world that I work in, we call them occult infections because they're hidden. Um, and so, you know, many people have occult infections and don't know about them, you know? And they have, oh, migraines or this or that. And as you know, a lot of people have breast implants that are making them sick and they don't really know why they don't feel good. Um, and sometimes when you take care of the infections and you remove all of the obstacles, including breast implants, people feel better. Right. Well, so. I, I think, you know, this comes just from my very kind of basic immunology training in medical yeah. school. It, it all comes down to how your immune system is reacting to one stimulus or another. This, True. this you know, the whole thing with breast implant illness, even though I've been taking care of patients with BII for a long time, it wasn't until... We, we saw COVID come along, and then, you know, toward the end of 2020, they started describing long COVID, right, which is basically a chronic COVID. Correct. Um, that, I, that I started seeing the, the similarities, and then if you look at those two and then compare them with symptoms of Lyme disease, they're also very similar, right? So yes. The, the question is why, and, and 
and the only explanation that I can think of is that it's probably some sort of immune response that's similar, right? Yes. Um, because there's a difference between, you know, I think uh, the average listener may or may not understand the difference between, you know, a Lyme infection, like in a, what we call an acute Lyme infection, which is what happens when when that, uh, was it, uh, Ber Bergdorferi, uh, Borrelia Bergdorferi is the name of the bug that causes Lyme disease, when that enters your bloodstream through a tick bite, like you get, you can get an acute infection if the dose is high enough, right? Just like with any, any bacter bacteria or virus. Mm -hmm. There's an acute infection and then you can get very, very common. This was a very common board question mm -hmm. when, you're, when we're, we were studying for our boards, you know, the, the, erythema, the erythema migrans, mm -hmm. which looks but like a, a bullseye rash. But a lot of people don't rash. get that. So they don't get it. There's yeah. a lot of variability yes. to it, but it, it's, a, it's a classic, uh, classic board question. And then, you know, that the, the important point at that point is to get treated with antibiotics, right? But even when people get treated with antibiotics, there's a subpopulation of people who will go on to chronic disease. And especially if you don't get treated with antibiotics, it's a larger percentage of people that are going to go on to chronic disease. And chronic disease is not really responsive to antibiotics. It's almost like, and I was explaining this uh, to Elizabeth earlier, mm -hmm. it's almost like when syphilis came on the scene, you can get syphilis and you can get treated with syphilis with antibiotics, but if it goes untreated for a long period of time, you can get basically chronic syphilis, which is known as tertiary syphilis, which is develops Make into wins. neurologic manifestations, yeah. which are not responsive to antibiotics. It just becomes a chronic disease process. So both Borrelia and syphilis are spirochetes, so that is the same genus of, you know, bacteria. Um, there's so much to say, and yes, um, you know, there's a lot of different philosophies about chronic Lyme versus acute Lyme. Also, Lyme in, in our world has become an umbrella because when we speak of Lyme disease, we speak of Lyme and co-infections, and we talk about um, you know, the main co-infections are Babesia, Bartonella, Ehrlichia, um, and, you know, there's, there's a number of other tick-borne illnesses or vector-borne illnesses that are in the same umbrella, you know, that are covered in Lyme disease, excuse me, but especially um, if you look at an IgenX, which is a particular test that um, helps people test for uh, Lyme in a particular way. But with Lyme disease, I, I like to say it's a little bit of a Rubik's Cube because there's this kind of... Um, and, and I think it helps to understand breast implant illness in the context of this. You know, if you look at toxins, infections, and then there are four genus of, there are four different types of infections. So there's mold, viruses, parasites, and bacteria. And if you start to look at that and see what is the hierarchy in each person's body and what needs attention first, and eliminate all the obstacles one by one, and you know, an implant could be part of that or it could be a root canal, or it could be an appendix that's smoldering, or there's so many things, you know. So, and when we look at long COVID, or we look at COVID like the Lyme community has shot in for it because they've already been through it for so many years, they understand it better. So yeah, there, it, it's a very complex puzzle. One of the reasons why I have a function is that I help people unravel this puzzle and then help them find the right care. Right, so yeah. that's, that was gonna be my next question is, is <laughs> Like, what what has created this void that you needed to fill, right? Because because there clearly was a void, and that's why you filled it, right? Yeah. There was a void of of bridging, you know, patients who were treated by their care. By, I'm sorry, patients who were treated by their doctor for X, Y, and Z, and then now they're not being treated because there's you know for various reasons, either because they don't know how to to diagnose and treat it, or because they don't think it's one diagnosis, or they misdiagnose it as something else, or they, which I hear a lot, it's after a while of complaining to your doctor about the same thing without any real demonstrable uh, evidence, a lot of physicians will say, well, this is you know psychosomatic, it's all in your head, there's, there's nothing going on here, right. kind of get over it. So people, you know, oftentimes on average have seen 50 physicians, you know, and they've been everywhere and they've tried to put it together themselves and then, you know, they feel lost and they don't have 
um, a guide or a voice even left to themselves. Um, many of the people I work with now, and you know, I, I tend to work with people longer term because it's, it's, it's unfortunately not an overnight process getting people to a better place. Um, can take anywhere from a year to five years with some people, you know, and and then also once people understand this path of wellness, you know, there's no turning back. And I think there's an overlap between kind of the chronic health community and um, the opti optimizing community of health, sort of the biohacking communities. They sort of intersect. And at one very, point, very much so. Very yeah. much so. And so at one point, the people that are have been chronically ill then become biohackers and they sort of, you know, grow into that. And so I can guide that as well. Um, so yeah, helping people navigate the very difficult terrain, whether it's finding the right doctors or going to the right countries or you know, sort of being the protocol police, managing their protocols. They've got 10 on their counter. They don't know how to put them all together. They don't know which goes first. They don't even know what this means. And or they don't even know what BID means, you know, and I have to, I'm sort of a translator between doctor to patient. Um, so, so where does the rubber meet the road, right? right? So someone contacts you because yeah. they don't know what to do, right? And, and then you have your initial interaction with them, mm -hmm. how, do, how does that then turn into I work your, um, your game with, plan? with patients under contract, so I'm contracted to work with them for a period of time, you know, period of hours. Um, I have some families that I've been working with for seven years, you know, and, um, and oftentimes I'll start with one member of the family and it tends to grow. I love working with big families or, you know, like a, a whole ecosystem because then I can really make transformation. Right. Um, it's difficult for family members to understand that Lyme is a real thing for some people, you know, and so to be able to affect transformative journey for the entire family and then for them to understand it with their own health as well and sometimes they're there are uh, symptoms or health issues that the parents had and they brought their child in and then they didn't know that they had all those symptoms as well. So it's nice to see families transform. Um, and then, you know, uh, depending on what the journey will be for each family or each patient that I work with, managing their, I don't like to take away the care that people bring to the table because they've come by it honestly and they've worked to where they are today. And I think it's really important to honor where people have been and acknowledge the road they've already traveled, but to contribute to it and to bring more so that they can grow and develop and transform. But also, um, you know, we, we don't, we don't, I feel like we midwife people. I midwife people to better. I, it's not my journey, it's theirs. And how do I meet them where they are so that they can take it to the next place? Well, I was really excited to have you on because one of my best girlfriends um, ha has Lyme disease. Uh -huh. And it's chronic and it's really, really bad. There's days she can't get out of bed. Yeah. Um, and so to me, it boggles my mind as somebody that doesn't have Lyme disease. The struggle that I see her when she goes to doctors, and it's really, really hard to find Lyme literate doctors, or however the medical terminology. No, that's is. that's perfect. Yeah, that's yes. what we call but it. Yeah. You, and exactly. You're referring to physicians, physicians. who are you, who are able to diagnose and treat chronic, but they can't. Chronic but they can't Lyme treat symptoms, Lyme. Right? So the, right. this is what I'm coming across with her. So she's right now on functional medicine. Mm -hmm. So she's learned so much about her body that Lyme experts have not um, been able to help her. And then a lot of the things that she needs is not is out of pocket. It's not even covered by insurance. Oh yeah, this is a whole. There's the, is really not an insurance game for Lyme patients. Well, that's I, I don't that's, understand that's that. but that's true for functional Breast medicine in general. In yeah. general, because and. It, it doesn't make intuitive sense because if insurance companies would actually look at the numbers and that preventative care, like they say they're into preventative care, but they're but not they're really not. into preventative care or they're not into the right preventative care, they'd be saving so much money keeping people healthy as opposed to treating them when they're sick. Well, and maybe, yeah. and maybe joining the functional medicine community to actually figure out because I, she's an amazing journalist. She's a war correspondent. She is, and I see her, there's days that 
she's okay and okay, never feeling great. Mm -hmm. And then there's days that she can't even walk and brain fog. And, and I'm like, yeah, the brain fog is what makes it very difficult for patients to be able to advocate for themselves because they have word retrieval issues and they actually can't be historians for their own journey. So um, that is really a useful part of my function is to actually keep th their history communicated and then also manage what's being said in a doctor's office because they can't always figure it out when they get home. What did they say and what was that and why right, am I taking this? And yeah. And the protocols are big, you know. I mean, unfortunately, um, people with Lyme disease or people with chronic health issues, I like to call it spinach, people with spinach. <laughs> yeah. Because at this point, it's just become so, you know, I feel like we need to rebrand Lyme disease on some level. Like there's just, it, it doesn't, it, and now with long COVID, it's, for me, it's become kind of a combination, you know. Um, but they just don't have the ability, even these protocols, like they, let's say that you get a three page or a two page protocol from, you know, a physician, um, to be able to stage that protocol for a patient because they can't do it all at once or they'll have such a bad Herxheimer reaction from doing that protocol all at once, you know, and a lot of these Lyme literate doctors are experts and so they're, they're not like an everyday doctor, you know, you'll see them maybe every three months or you'll see them every six months and who's going to bridge the gap when right. they don't know, you know, what to do in between. So, you know, it's a so, lot to do. So that's, that's a good question is, so like with, with breast implant illness, with BII, it's, it's pretty clear now. I mean, I've taken care of hundreds and hundreds of patients. It's pretty clear. You remove the stimulus, mm -hmm. the implant and the capsule that's around it. And 90 plus percent of the time, they they get better to some degree, right? They, you'll have some improvement in symptoms, almost sure. acro almost sure. across the board. It's not it's not 100 percent. Nothing is, but but almost across the board. With with Lyme, how do you remove the stimulus? Like what what are you able to offer them? Yeah. To at at that point when it's in the chronic phase. So once again, it's sort of that Rubik's cube you know, journey, like where are the stressors? And, and look, there are people that have, that could test for the same infections and not have issues. You know, to your point, what you were saying before, it, what part of that person's immune system has been dinged? Uh, my mentor, Dietrich Klinghart, likes to call Lyme disease AIDS minor. It's interesting. I mean, like HIV was very quickly recognized and accepted as an immunodeficiency virus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The hypothesis is that perhaps Lyme disease or the uh, Bor uh, Bor Borrelia, Borrelia burgdorferi. <laughs> Every time I took a test on it's this, it's not I, an I easy bugged. word to say. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps that's doing something similar. Right. Right. But so, why, why do you think that that wasn't? Why do you think that that hasn't caught on? Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, re I mean really? Why? Go I mean, for it. I mean, especially, <laughs> especially because if you I think mean, about the, the HIV community in the 1980s, it was such a stigma. Um, this is this is ostensibly a, a tick-borne phenomenon. Like, why why would there be more so of a stigma for now? for me, it's not tick-borne, it's vector-borne, which is a big can of worms. Because if we look at the vectors, we look at all the insects, you know, spiders, fleas, you know, Bartonella is cat scratch fever, and it is right. a co-infection of Lyme. And, you know, if you have a cat and there's fleas, then you could have Bartonella, you know what I mean? So... I think it's really overwhelming for the world at large to accept that it's not a tick-borne issue, um, and it's really hard to imagine that, that's that how it's that's how it's been taught. Yes, and that's but how it's it continues true. to be taught, and that's how it's portrayed. <laughs> and if you even if you look at the CDC website, it, it says it's that. Yeah. So Lyme community, you know, based Lyme literate doctors, Lyme community support people, and Lyme patients do not see that the CDC understands their predicament. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> I, I agree. Um, not to be controversial, but um, it's a controversial topic, period, as is long COVID, as are, is breast implant illness, frankly. Um, and, you know, 
I, I mean, I'm, this is, you know, I have to be careful because A, I'm, I'm not a licensed physician. I'm a support person that has extremely, you know, gained knowledge throughout the years. It's very, very savvy, but I'm not a doctor. I can't, you know, rec I don't treat people. I'm, I'm, I'm part of the team, right, and the right. support. Um, you help coordinate it, I'm, right? The yeah, mm -hmm. yes. But I do have some doctors that tease me and call me doctor because I don't, I don't call myself that. But one has to become, you know, especially in a, in a group or in a room where one is not licensed and one is savvy, one has to accept that they may be the most disenfranchised person in the group, but at the same time is still willing to contribute, right? So from the perspective of what you're asking in terms of like how does one manage all these infection or this infection or this tick-borne infection, which some people will say is Lyme disease, which some people will say is Borrelia, well, the answer is that's not what we manage because Borrelia is just one thing that's okay. a part of the soup, right? It's a very large soup that includes toxins, that includes potentially organ issues or, you know, encapsulated breasts, tish, you know, enca encapsulated breast implants or a root canal or an infection in a tooth that's dead that nobody's addressed or, you know, so all of these. So it could be like these, a multi-hit phenomenon. It's a multi-hit phenomenon. And the reason. So it's, it's a, is that to suggest that each person, you have to individualize correct. it because everyone's got different correct. history? Correct. 100%. Right. And the other thing is not everybody responds to the interventions are the same. So if you have a, and this is, this is the bane of my existence, a, a room full of, of, you know, patients that are sitting, you know, getting IVs and like, well, I did that and she did this and we did this and how right. come I'm not doing that? I'm like, because you, you're not the same patient, you don't have the same issues and you're not responding to the treatment the same way. You know, some people do incredibly well with you know, especially pandas, pans patient, which is another conversation, which is part of the journey with, with patients who have chronic illness. Um, so pediatric autoimmune neuropsych disorders related to strep. My friend's son just got diagnosed with it's that. It's a big bugaboo. I had, um, I mean, it's really, really hard. I had a, a young man that I still work with that, you know, I met when he was 23, who had been everywhere, everywhere, including wilderness, et cetera you know, for addiction, because it, it's a severe OCD, you know, That's severe, yeah, with. severe, severe. I'm going to hook um, you guys up. At any rate, um, he was, he was, you know, weighed 118 pounds at 6'2", because they food restrict, they bed wet, um, there's a lot of um, components to pans, pandas, and, you know, um, three years later, you know, he, he's well, and I mean, that, you, tonsils are a part of that equation because strep resides in the tonsils and sometimes Lyme patients need tonsillectomies. So it is, it is multifactorial. It is, that's why I use the Rubik's Cube. I like to say people with Lyme disease um, take a bunch of confetti, throw it in a high wind over a stream, see how it lands, and then let's see how we can unravel that particular picture. And it is unique to each person. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons people struggle along for so many years with so many different people because there's no cookie cutter solution for any patient. It just yeah. does not exist. But yet the incidence of Lyme anyway, or what's being diagnosed as Lyme, seems to be only increasing. 100%. Uh, roughly 70% over the last five years, 70% mm -hmm. 70, 70 uh, so year by year increase. Um, A, why do you think that is? And B, in, in those numbers, if you kind of parse them out, there's a significantly almost two to one uh, weight of diagnosis of chronic Lyme in women versus men. Why do, you, why do, we, why do we think that? Um, yeah, you know, I, I, my experience is that women in general are more willing to communicate that they're suffering or They're have a problem as willing to listen to us that's that that is true that is true um men well just doctors. people in, oh. doctors doctors yeah um but but they they have you know a, a, an ability to seek deeper i mean i i work with I work with families and husbands and wives, you know, and oftentimes, or moms that are, you know, coming to 
get help for their kids. And then the moms jump on board and then the dads are like really reluctant and resistant and they just don't believe it and they're like, oh, hogwash. And then, you know, year, two years go by and the dads are like, wow, can you help me? Yeah. And I'm like, sure. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's a process oftentimes. And that's not just one family. I have multiple families where that's occurred. So um, I think that's part of it, you know. Um, I think um, in that in that structure, you know, the husbands often think that maybe the 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 children and the moms are prey to you know a medical process that's not authentic, and it's it you look look people have to be careful. There are inauthentic medical processes out there, yes. you know, that are that are predatory towards people that have issues. So. Um, but and one, you know, I think I do. I, I do think there's something to it that you know, women um, somehow, because women have children, women obviously have menses, women have, they're um, potentially more um, at at risk. I mean, at risk is not the right word. They're more uh, prone to develop these things and. Potentially, um, there is an emotional factor to all illnesses. Not to say, I mean, I'm I'm the first one to say like it's not a psychosomatic issue. I'm there for people who have, but there are a lot of factors in terms of you know different um, frontiers that people are overcoming in terms of their own emotional um, setbacks right. that can sometimes trigger you know, a Lyme infection or a, a chronic health issue, and Lyme could be a part of it. Some, and sometimes you test um, husbands and wives, they have the exact same bugs, and the wives are very, very ill, and the husbands are not. Yeah. So do I have an answer to that? Do I know how to tell you why, why that is? Not, not really, not 100%, but it is a phenomenon. I worked with Kent Holthorff, um, we did a veterans project, and so we were helping veterans, and we were vetting them for all of their chronic health issues. Obviously, they had tremendous amounts of toxins. You know, they'd been Gulf War syndrome, mycoplasma illness, all kinds of things. But we tested them for all of the Lyme bugs, you know, and all of, and they all had positive Lyme disease, um, co-infections, co et cetera, you know. And so it's interesting to see um, where it impacted even the veteran community. Now that's a very controversial journey because, you know, um, they get vaccinated quite a lot and we don't know what's in their, I mean, they get way more vaccines than the average patient population. Right. So, but we, we explored this, you know, to see, and they had really, I mean, severe um, PTSD, severe, you know, we helped them with ketamine assisted psychotherapy, all sorts of things. So. That's, uh, that's taken off, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I truly believe that past trauma affects your health in the future. Oh, for sure. Like, I myself have, you know, I, I don't love psychedelics personally. Like, I've done ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. Um, it was tough for me. At first, I did it IV, and then I, I worked with this wonderful um, guy named Mike Dow, um, who um, was um, at the place that closed in Santa Monica. I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, but it'll come to me and they do intramuscular and it was so much gentler, you know, because some, some patients, I'm, I'm one of them. Um, they don't need a lot of intervention in order, you know, they could be too much for them. And right. a lot of people who have had Lyme or who have had, um, various infections and stuff, they have sensitive systems. So you have to kind of, that's another thing. Dosing is a huge part of the journey, you know, like there's no general dosing for these patients. Yeah. Yeah. But that... That, that's interesting because um, use of things like ketamine, psilocybin, MDMA, is, that's very popular now in the mm -hmm. uh, PTSD world, especially in veterans. Well, LSD, yes. I just read an article, yes. I sent it to me yesterday, LSD yes. might get approved for... Yes. Um, for PTSD? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, you had mentioned vaccines. There mm -hmm. Currently, there's no, as far as I'm aware, there's no available vaccine for Lyme mm -hmm. disease. Now, this is going to be, I, I kind of know how you're going to answer this because you had, you've already said about five times, it's not just Lyme disease, right? So mm -hmm. even if you have a, a Lyme-specific vaccine, mm -hmm. um, we still are looking at other potential co-infectors, right? Correct. Yeah. So, uh, so what do you think the future is going to be for trying to prevent this? Um, prevent? I don't know because, you know, 
unless people just stop interacting, which I don't think is going to happen, <laughs> um, I think the future is smarter people, more smart people. More, more self-aware. More self-aware patients, but also smarter doctors to help more people. Or maybe it's not that the doctors aren't smart, it's that they're not being educated properly. More education. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, no, I mean, it's true. It's true, There's though, a lot of, because you, I mean, I, 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 I think, I, I, think I, I mean that. Yeah, no, I know, yes. I, know. I know, I'm just, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just clarifying. But I didn't mean to say I know, that No, no, I know a lot, so a lot of great, no, 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 not at all. I know a lot <laughs> of great physicians, no, <laughs> I know a lot of great physicians <laughs> yeah. who are amazing at what they do, but they're not educated in yeah. certain areas, because, and I know that because I was educated the same way that sure. they were. I and I, I recognize the deficiencies in our education. Yeah. And, and until that changes, a lot of this functional medicine and, and preventative stuff is, is going to stay the same. Yeah. I mean, that's one of my missions is to help educate further, you know, and at the same time as inspiring people that they can transform, but also educating, you know, um, patients, doctors, lay people, whomever, about this. It, it's, it's a mission of mine to educate further. There's a lot to learn. We could talk to you all day. We have mm. to have you back, because we haven't mm. even hit the surface of all the things we wanted to I talk about sorry. today. <laughs> oh my god, no. I feel like you have more friends with uh, problems that you need to talk to her about. We can do a sidebar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is that what it is? It's just no. friends with problems? No, no, yeah. 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 You want to talk that could be a whole well, other look, podcast. Hello, friends I'm with friends pro pro with problems. <laughs> Thank, thanks a lot. <laughs> you want to start a podcast called yeah, friends, friends with Problems? problems. So, um, so, but yeah, I always, I always kind of wrap up each uh, episode with a very ge generic question. Okay. And, and that is, if you weren't doing this now, what do you think, had you not gotten into being a health coach, health specialist, what do you think you'd be doing with your life? Yeah, you know, I don't know that I wouldn't be doing this if I wasn't doing this because sort of all roads lead to Rome. Um, however, there are other things that I do do. Uh, I mean, I'm a writer. Um, I'm currently writing a book of poetry um, about my grief around the loss of my sister. Oh. Um, and I'm, I really like to write. You know, I went to Bennington and I was a lit, ma a lit minor and a drama major. So um, I grew up in a sort of fine arts, you know, family, essentially. My mother's a writer. Um, so really the arts are sort of my second passion. But I, I like to work with medical artists. Um, and I think that the doctors that I work with are medical artists. They're artists of sorts. And so, um, but anyway, my sister left a, a suitcase filled with her mammograms and all of these poems and paintings. And so I'm sort of doing a call and response book oh, cool. with her poetry and mine. Oh my God, how beautiful. Yeah. That's so cool. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, you have to let us know when, yeah. that, when that lands. Yeah. Well, really uh, quick, um, could you let our listeners know yeah. um, to camera where they can find you and um, if, all your if, social If they're media. suffering or if they have a friend or family yeah. member who might be. Yeah. And just, I mean, I, I work with Lyme patients, but I've worked with ALS patients, cancer patients, um, any type of long-suffering, chronic, patients. BII patients. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been with people through explant, um, Alzheimer's. I mean, nowadays we, we have rapamycin, which is an amazing intervention. It's an anti-aging intervention, but it's an intervention for people who have... Um, any kind of dementia. Um, so it's daisywhite.com. Um, you can find me. And Ann April Daisy, because my name is April Daisy White, and I'm an April Daisy. And so Ann April Daisy is my um, Instagram handle. And um, yes, you can find me. Well, <laughs> I, we, hope, we hope they reach out. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for coming on. This Thank was very interesting. Me. Very Thank interesting. You. Um, Appreciate it. And yeah, well, you have to keep us posted, and when and when your your book of poetry uh, yes. drops, well, maybe we'll uh, have another episode. That'd be great. Thank you. Yes. yes. All right, Thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Beyond the OR with Dr. Brenner. Make sure to subscribe, like, and follow so you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, hit me up on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok.
at Kevin Brenner MD and KevinBrennerMD.com.